So what just happened there? Well, to begin with, when the operator poured fuel into the fuel tank, it flowed out of the tank, through the fuel line, and into the float bowl of the carburetor. And as it continued to flow in, it raised the float. This raised the needle valve and shut off any more fuel coming in. That now means that the only exit the fuel has out of here is up through the main jet. And so let's have a look how this happens. So first of all, making sure that the lawnmower was in the ready to start on position. The operator reached down and activated the choke, or the cold start. That then activated this choke plate and closed it. Then, when the operator pulled the starter pull cord, this turned the engine's crankshaft and caused the piston to lower. As it did so, two main things happened. Firstly, it created a suction pressure above it. And secondly, the inlet valve opened. So let's now take a look at how that happened. As the piston lowers on the induction stroke, the crankshaft is of course turning and that turns the camshaft. As the camshaft turns, that pushes up the cam followers. The cam followers push up on the push rod and the push rod pushes up on the back of the rocker arm. Because the rocker arm is a pivot, pushing up at the back makes it push down at the front and that compresses the valve spring. This downward pressure from the rocker arm opens the inlet valve. With the exhaust valve closed tightly, the piston continues to lower, creating more of that suction pressure which is felt all the way up through the inlet valve and through the induction tube of the carburetor. And because the choke plate or the choke butterfly is closed, thus restricting air coming into the carburetor, that pressure builds up inside the induction tube. And so this increased amount of suction pressure in here is felt all the way down the main jet. And so the restricted airflow enters the carburetor's venturi and the increased pressure inside there draws out a high volume of fuel. As the air hits this high volume of fuel, it atomizes it and the fuel accompanies the air through the induction tube and into the engine's cylinder above the piston. Because the engine hadn't been running previously and was cold, this large amount of fuel is going to be vital in getting the engine initially started. And therefore, this is the essence of the engine's cold start or choke system. And so the piston continues to lower, drawing in this mixture, a ratio that's rich in fuel compared to air. But the crankshaft continues turning and starts to push the piston back upwards. So let's now have a look at how all of this movement affects the valves. So the engine continues to turn and that moves away the raised point of the cam, allowing the cam follower to settle on the lower part of the cam. And it will stay that way for almost a full revolution. This allows the push rod to lower, which allows the back of the rocker arm to lower, and thus the valve spring at the front is allowed to raise again. This closes the inlet valve, preventing any leak back into the carburetor as the piston continues to push against the air and fuel mixture. And at the same time, the second cam at the back, at the low point, making sure that the exhaust valve is closed, allowing the piston to rise with both valves closed on the compression stroke. And so with both the exhaust and inlet valves closed, the piston compresses this mixture of air and fuel. Because the piston is travelling so fast, the spark plug fires and starts to ignite the air and fuel before the piston reaches the top, or top dead centre. This is known as ignition timing advance. This gives the air and fuel a little more time to fully ignite before the split second that the piston reaches its uppermost point which is then forced back down again by the explosion, which is the result of the rapid burning of all of that air and fuel mixture, thus rapidly combusting it, and is the reason that this is called an internal combustion engine. Left in its wake is a mass of smoke, which is the exhaust gases. Now combustion has occurred, and the piston's been forced back down in the power stroke, that comes in time with the turning distance of the crankshaft, the high point of the cam at the back that opens the exhaust valve, pushes the cam follower upwards. 
And because the exhaust rocker arm is now pushed up at the back, it pushes down on the exhaust valve spring, thus opening the exhaust valve and the rising of the piston pushes out all of those exhaust gases through the exhaust valve and out through the exhaust. After pushing out the exhaust gases and still moving by the energy of momentum given by the last power stroke, the piston now continues downwards into the next induction stroke, drawing in air and fuel and repeating the cycle. That is until we hear the engine initially fire. Because remember we're still on cold start and so this high ratio of fuel compared to air mixture is only good to get the engine to fire from cold. It certainly won't run on this increased amount. And if we try to do so and keep trying to start it with the cold start applied, it will just flood the engine with way too much fuel. Too much fuel for the engine to combust. And at this point, the engine will not start at all. So the engine initially fires and the cold start is removed. And the choke butterfly on the carburetor is now open. And so this time when the operator pulls the pull cord and the piston lowers, there's less buildup of suction pressure inside the induction tube of the carburetor, meaning less fuel is being drawn out, and at the same time more air is rushing through, making the ratio of air to fuel mix much better for the engine to run successfully. And so they are the four strokes, and that's of course why this is called a four stroke engine or a four cycle engine. So now the engine has started, how does it govern its own speed? So being as we're talking about the governor system, we'll start with the governor arm. And we can see that the governor arm has this governor spring attached to it, and the other end is attached to this permanent fixture. This makes the governor arm spring back when we pull it like that. And the other important structure on the governor arm is this governor rod, and this comes all the way up to the throttle lever on the carburetor. If we just take a look at the governor arm in this position where the spring is pulling it this way and of course pulling the rod this way as well, thus pushing the throttle lever this way, then we can see that the result of that is that the throttle plate or the throttle butterfly is in the fully open position, meaning that maximum airflow can go through into the engine. So that means that when the governor arm is in its pulled back position, the throttle plate is in its closed position. So you can see that happening there. And so with the way this is all designed, with the spring pulling that way, the throttle plate is naturally open when the engine is not running. We can now have a look at the heart of the governing system, where it originates. And where it actually originates is inside the sump of the engine. The governor arm is directly connected to the internal part of the governor arm here. So when I move this, you can see that the governor arm on the outside is moving as well. There's a special gear that sits inside here, and that's this gear here. As we can see, this is not just a gear, because when these wings open, it pushes a special plastic part in the middle outwards. And the way these open is by centrifugal force. This circular cutout piece sits on the end of the camshaft like that excluding this part here which I've put on to stabilise the camshaft. So when the gear is placed in position, that special plastic part in the middle sits there on top of the inside governor arm. And the cogs on the gear are splined in with the cogs of the gear of the camshaft. And so when the engine's running and the camshaft is turning, that turns this gear. It will be spinning incredibly fast and this will happen. These wings will spread out under centrifugal force as the gear turns. And as we know, that will push this centerpiece out. And when this is in position and that plastic centerpiece is pushed out, it pushes down on the lever. This whole rod is forced down against the spring and that closes the throttle plate. And this is basically how it governs the system. So the engine starts on full throttle, maximum airflow, the engine will of course turn and get up to speed, but because of the maximum airflow in, rather than the engine revving high enough to damage itself, this mechanical governor system kicks in and adjusts the leverage and closes the throttle plate accordingly, thus lowering the revs and of course saving the engine. This system wouldn't be just either right up or right down, 
it would also work intermediately depending on how fast the engine is running. So however fast the engine is running, this throttle plate will be adjusting accordingly. And so when the engine starts to slow down and this gear slows down, the spring takes over and lifts the lever back up. That pushes the centre plastic part back up in place. And that has opened the throttle plate once again. And so left to its own devices without any external movement of the throttle lever by the operator, then the engine would find an happy medium at which it would run.